Okay, I think we can get started now. Um, as again, welcome to this uh, Datadog On episode. Datadog On is a series of episodes where we invite engineers working in Datadog uh, to tell us about how they're building Datadog on a daily basis. And um, we have a lot of already episodes on our website. So if you go to datadogon.datadoghq.com, uh, you can watch the recordings of the previous ones, but also the this one once it's finished. So it, this recording will be also uh, published was, once we are done. Today's episode uh, is super interesting because we are going to be talking about building responsive user experience at Datadog. And to talk about this topic, we are going to uh, talk about a project that uh, just we just released at Datadog, which is the new dashboard layouts. And uh, we are going to be talking through how that design and development process happened. So um, some housekeeping items. Uh, we are going to leave enough time at the very end for questions. We want these sessions to be as interactive as possible. So please, if you have any questions, you don't have to wait until the very end. Just press the Q&A button that you have on your Zoom client leave there the question and we will come back to them um, at the end of the prepared content. So um, obviously this talk is not about data itself or data as a company. Uh, data on again is about how we build data dog itself. So the design and engineering process that we follow to work on data dog. But just so you know, what we do, Datadog is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps companies improve observability of their infra and applications. My name is Sara Pulida, I'm a technical evangelist here at Datadog, and I'm one of the co-hosts and co-organizers of the Datadog on series. So if you have any feedback about the format, if you have any topics you want us to cover, uh, please reach out. Um, I'll be happy to, to hear about your feedback. But today, the important people here are Edwin and Amy. Edwin, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Ara. Um, I'm Edwin, designer here at Datadog in New York. Uh, I've been here for about a year and a half, uh, working on dashboard features, and most notably on this newest release, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I love building on the web. I've been uh, doing it for a couple of years and have been in both uh, design and front-end development roles. Good. Amy? Yeah, and hi, I'm Amy. Uh, I'm a software engineer on the Dashboard Features team. Um, I also joined a little over uh, a year ago full-time, and I previously interned at Datadog. Um, I mainly work on UI features related to the viewing and editing experience of dashboards, um, also including the new dashboard layout, uh, which I work closely with Edward on. Cool. Um, so yeah, key people to talk about this. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, just to understand about uh, data scale. So um, I think it's important because some of the decisions that we make um, take that into account. So data doc has more than 12,000 customers. And obviously we are on a monitoring platform. So we gather data from the infrant applications from our customers and that adds up to millions of hosts which translates in trillions of data points per day. And with all the data that we get from our customers, uh, obviously having a way to visualize that data uh, to our customers in a way that they can uh, gather information about how their systems are behaving, how their applications are behaving, it's definitely a key aspect of the product. Uh, so let's, let's do, obviously we are going to be talking about how we have built this new uh, dashboard layout. But just in case you're not familiar with the dashboards at Datadog, um, I'm going to ask Amy and Edwin to give us a little bit of an overview of what are dashboards at Datadog and why are they so important. Uh, so Amy, you, you want to give us an overview of dashboards? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so dashboards are central to the Datadog experience and they're one of the core products that we offer um, so they are a powerful tool to display and analyze information in a visual way. And our users often use them to monitor infrastructure health, uh, resolve incidents, track feature usage, and they can do like so much more. 
so this is an example of a screen board, which is one of the dashboard layout types. And screen boards have pixel perfect free layouts that can include graphs as well as decorative elements like images and iframes. Uh, so this layout type is most commonly used as like status boards to be displayed on TVs or for storytelling views with data narratives. Uh, and this is an example of a time board, um, which is the more popular of the two layout types. Uh, so time boards have an automatic layout uh, and all widgets are scoped to the same time frame for easy correlation. Um, so in this layout, widgets are all the same size, uh, but users have the ability to create groupings for related widgets, such as web store performance, um, as shown here. And time boards are most commonly used for troubleshooting, correlation, and data exploration. Uh, so for, for time boards, uh, which you said are the most popular, um, so being all the widgets in the time frame, uh, and I, I guess that those are mainly used to things correlate data points. For example, if you're getting an increase of 500 errors in your application, uh, trying to correlate that to, for example, networking data to see if there is any correlation there. Yeah, exactly. And like another use case, which we often use within our own team, uh, is to track metrics around feature usage. So if we're beta testing a feature with, let's say, like a new button, we might track how many clicks this button receives over the course of a few days to gauge the discoverability of the feature. And yeah, until the past spring, users had to choose between one of these two layout types that were best suited for pretty different use cases. So screen boards, which have high layout fl flexibility, but don't really scale between screen sizes and require a lot of placement effort, or time boards, which are very fast to create and use, but are pretty limited in their customization and layout capabilities. Um, and having to decide upfront uh, what's, what type of issue you're planning to solve in the future, like either a general view of your infra or service or a quick dot dashboard to correlate data points, um, this seems a bit limiting. And we also found that users could benefit from features of both layout types. Um, so like if there was an easier way to create neat consistent layouts on screen boards, or if you could alter widget dimensions on time boards to better fit the viz. Um, for example, like the log stream or the top list widget that could often use some more height to be readable on time boards. And uh, all, all, all of these reasons are why we released the new dashboard layout type, um, which Edwin will introduce. Right. So this is an example of a, a dashboard in that new dashboard layout type. It's something that we think kind of combines the low floor of time boards and the high ceiling of screen boards. So you can get started really quickly, just like time boards, just drag a bunch of graphs onto the screen. Uh, but it has a, a lot more flexibility. You know, you can resize widgets. Um, you can drag them around on this 12 column grid uh, where they snap into place. And we have some kind of discrete automatic behaviors like resizing with your browsers, which was a, the big missing feature for screen boards, um, or showing more of your dashboard on a wide display and, uh, and other things like compacting widgets together vertically when you drag them onto the dashboard. Uh, we've added a bunch of little quality of life improvements like that to the editing experience. You know, here I'm showing uh, myself dragging a widget up into this space that's actually a little too small to fit it, but we just sort of size snap that widget down to fit. Uh, we have a lasso selection tool as well and bulk actions attached to that. So it makes it a lot faster to do um, something to a bunch of widgets at once. And we also have resizable groups and a bunch of other stuff. And we're working on even more features like this to make it easy for users to make dashboards quickly and pick the right kind of dashboard type that fits their needs. And working on all these features has been the team's focus for this whole past year or so. I'm really excited to talk about uh, some examples of our process and a few of the features and specifics today. Yeah, I, I can confirm on a personal front that these new dashboards are great. I, I just migrated the default dashboards that I have for a couple of integrations that I maintain to this new format. And, and the result, I'm super happy with the result. It's, it was very easy to, to create the new dashboards and the, and the result is, is a lot, lot better. Good, so obviously I enjoy the final product and um, I love it <laughs> as, a, as a user. Um, but so that's why 
I'm super interested in knowing more about how this was designed and implemented. So uh, to start with the design part of, of it, um, so it seems uh, like a little bit difficult to design a layout system. So how, how do you create even start creating a spec uh, for a feature like, like this, like sag snapping, like you were mentioning, Edwin? Yeah, exactly. That's what made this project interesting. It wasn't like a typical design project where you have a couple simple workflows or you know, you're focusing on pixels, but instead it was about rules and constraints, uh, dealing with emergent behavior in the browser and, and overall like designing a lot of features that kind of go unnoticed and that get out of the user's way. Uh, it might be easier for me to show you what I'm talking about how the design approach that we used changed over the course of the project. Uh, so uh, these two, uh, or rather these four mockups are an example of, of where I started uh, with more traditional approaches, like lots of static mockups, storyboarding interactions. You know, here there are two storyboards for dragging multiple selected widgets uh, and small animations. So they were prototypes, but they were sort of simple one gesture prototypes like this one for resizing one widget that's directly adjacent to another widget. And what does that other widget do? Does it move down or does it shrink or does it nudge over? Uh, and there were also complicated specs for certain features like selection actions, uh, which is this floating menu that appears beside widgets when you've selected more than one. You know, we worked through like valid placements for this menu, for example, and the placement would depend on where your mouse was at the end of the drag event. That was the idea. Uh, but for features like this, the difficulty of specking out the design kind of rises steadily as you attempt to cover details and edge cases. Like it's useful as a visual guide, uh, like giving the team an idea of the goalpost. But once you begin coding, new constraints always kind of change the rules anyways. So you have to be flexible. Like in this particular case, uh, I put all this effort into specking out a bunch of valid positions uh, and different, you know, th these are just two examples, there were more. Uh, but when we started implementing the feature, we just started by showing the menu at the bottom left all the time so that we could get it into testing earlier. And then we decided later how much more complicated we wanted the placement logic to be once some users didn't uh, notice it. So this feature also made its way into simple prototyping uh, where nothing is really moving. Uh, you know, this just kind of gives a, a clear animated picture of what I was doing in the storyboards. Uh, and it's possible to, like I said, set goalposts this way, but I feel it's almost impossible to, or for the designer to understand how the idea will feel, uh, to find the right interaction, to like use the design process to give yourself the idea of what the right interaction should be. I think a big tool in the designer's toolbox is understanding if an interaction feels right. You know, is this annoying, repetitive, slow, confusing, hard to notice? If you only take a design as far as a storyboard or a single gesture prototype or something like that, you're leaving these reactions on the table. Yeah, so basically you're not you're not allowing your users to to love or hate. You're not allowing to have that gut reaction. Right. I think that you can answer a lot of questions before you even talk to users if you can get the fidelity of the design higher. And prototyping is one way to do this. Uh, you know, I mentioned that there were simple one gesture prototypes. This was a slightly more complicated one. Uh, this is from pretty early in the project, earlier than the others, actually. And I used Origami to make this, which is a prototyping app that Facebook makes. And it shows some ideas about, you know, displaying this grid, um, a drag placeholder in the background as I move the widget around, uh, hinting for the resize handles, stuff like that. But if you look closely, you can sort of tell, like, I'm moving the mouse very carefully in this coordinated way. Every movement looks very intentional. And that's because the prototype could like only do the stuff that I'm showing in this GIF, only the features that I added to it. And I recorded this like choreographed demo to show pretty much everything it could do and to communicate this sort of simple idea. And this is basically a more complicated version of storyboarding. You know, I knew what I wanted to demonstrate already. And this GIF was an effective way to communicate with the team, but it wasn't an effective way for me to figure out what the right behavior should have been. It doesn't help you understand what the feature feels like. Uh, for that, I think you need something a lot more robust. But the challenge is if you start to prototype with a prototyping tool like this to a level where it helps you think about what the right thing is to do, you really start to converge on this, the difficulty level of 
just making some feature in code like I would have had to re recreate a whole grid layout system with you know heuristics and constraints and automatic behavior in origami and honestly it would probably be harder to do that than to just write it in code and I would still just be faking it so I wouldn't get any of the emergent behavior that that comes up when you do stuff in the browser so really the the, the lesson there for me for this the early stage of design was just get closer to the real output earlier on and you're not going to waste as much time you know on details that don't matter or you know getting ahead of yourself with um, some interaction so after we had the basics in place rather than working through design prototypes and storyboards you know they were helpful and necessary in the beginning but once we had a foundation laid our team began working more closely together between design and development on code prototypes, just adding an idea or sometimes multiple versions of an idea onto the kind of bare bones dashboard, uh, building out you know, one feature at a time in this accumulative manner and then testing them. So we would implement features much earlier. We were testing constantly, taking down notes at the same pace and then iterating on the prototype in time for subsequent tests. And, and also it's a, it's a great benefit that uh, Datadog itself uh, it's one of the biggest Datadog users. Like we use Datadog to build Datadog. So um, all that the new features that we that we create, uh, they are released first to the Datadog itself, uh, so they they can provide feedback. Yeah, absolutely. That was really useful. Uh, like we'd find users just by monitoring specific actions we were interested in at that time. Like here, we're monitoring keyboard shortcuts and who internally was using those keyboard shortcuts, uh, so that we could then contact them and, and ask them questions. You know, is this easy as sending a Slack and booking a Zoom meeting? Because these people, we all work at the same company. And we have a lot of engineers starting on a regular basis here too, uh, who have never used dashboards before. And also a lot who have been using our dashboards for like, you know, seven plus years. So we could test across a really wide spectrum of experience. Um, so layout engines, they have a lot of edge cases, hard to predict behaviors. Uh, when, when you're building out rules that sound straightforward, like, you know, give it an empty space uh, that's slightly too small for the widget that's being dragged towards it, uh, squeeze that widget down to fit, even though it's too big. You know, for rules like that, it's, it's hard to know all the side effects uh, of that behavior without using it in a real prototype on a real dashboard. Like in reality, if you were to write a sentence of that behavior, there would be a, a couple more caveats in there. Uh, and mockups and design prototypes are just going to confirm the happy path. You, you probably won't run into uh, these behaviors that you didn't anticipate or these interactions that you didn't anticipate. Uh, you know, the behavior which we call squeeze to fit, uh, which you saw earlier is a great example, I think, of how code prototyping worked really well for us. Like first we observed repeated behavior in tests. Users were trying to drag widgets into spaces that were slightly too small. And they were frustrated because it didn't work out. Like whenever something like this comes up, uh, when you get in the user's way, they get taken out of the flow of using the product. And it's pretty common to get fixated on a little thing like this. Like you can see, they're trying to put it next to the other widget, but everything is just moving around and it's really annoying. And maybe they try to resize from the left, but it can only resize from the right. And so you get into this like rabbit hole of getting frustrated with the system. So we came up with an idea of how to address this. Sounds simple, just squeeze the widget down so it fits and snaps into place, right? And we implemented something that was simple, but when we implemented and tested it, we were resizing way too aggressively. Like widgets that were 1400 pixels wide, the whole width of the dashboard were being squeezed down to 14, or sorry, to 400 pixels, uh, like to you know one quarter of the width of the dashboard. And users never intended to squeeze these big widgets into these small spaces. It's just that the constraints we wrote acted like a magnet where we were like sucking in all these widgets to these really tiny spaces. Uh, and this behavior was very surprising, seemed broken, obviously was broken, uh, but, you know, was doing what we, what the naive solution was that we came up with from, uh, from this rapid iteration process. And we hadn't gotten the constraints quite right. So we tweaked the constraints a little bit, put it back into testing, uh, and we limited the amount that a widget could be reduced by, just, just by one column. So if it's like close enough. Uh, so we tested this more and it stopped coming up or even being noticed. And that's how we knew that we'd hit the sweet spot, right? Because people really noticed it before. Uh, and now users just felt that 
the dashboard layout was doing exactly what they wanted it to do. They probably didn't even realize that some kind of exception was taking place. And this is an example of one of my favorite kind of design changes, like something that gets out of the user's way, basically goes completely unnoticed. But if you were to go and use another dashboarding product that hadn't done something like this, like it might just feel a little bit less easy. Or if you were to come to Datadog new from a different dashboard product, uh, it would somehow feel more easy to move things around and get the layout you want, but you maybe couldn't quite put your finger on it, right? And we have like a laundry list of stuff like this. So this testing process really helped us increase the speed at which we added these quality of life improvements. This was kind of like a heads down phase of the project. You know, we knew where we were heading and we just had to sort out a lot of details like this on the way. Uh, but we'll talk later about how I think the same approach works pretty well for big features, big undefined features and problems as well. So the, you know, the takeaway for me is take notes quickly, move on implementing changes decisively and don't overthink it. Like we were taking notes the same day, recording weekly takeaways the end of the week and bringing those to the Monday meetings so that we can plan stuff to implement in time for more tests. Quick and done, better than certain. Great, uh, great suggestion. Um, and I really love to see how something that for me, it feels like it, it just works. I don't know why, but it's it feels natural, uh, has a lot uh, of process. Uh, to, to get it to that point. Um, so let, let's talk about uh, the implementation. So we talk about the design. Uh, so Amy, can you tell us a bit about the implementation of the engine that make this uh, dashboards possible? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so when actually considering how to implement a layout engine that can su support all of these new awesome behaviors that we wanted for the new dashboards, uh, we first started looking into any existing open source libraries that were out there. And the one that we landed on was React Grid Layout, um, which we really liked. Um, and this library uses a pathery layout, uh, which just means that it creates draggable and gapless grids. So as you can see in this demo, the resize and drag actions uh, they snap to a grid and the other items will float up to fill the vertical space for a neater compact layout at the end. And we felt like this library could provide enough flexibility in rearranging while still having some automatic behavior to make it easy to create nice looking layouts at the end. Uh, so the two fundamental actions of this library are drag and resize. And although we were really happy with the base functionality of React Grid Layout, uh, we ended up having to write a custom library with actions based on React Grid layout, but with improvements to suit our specific layout needs. And uh, I'll go into some of the custom actions that we had to implement. The, the first being the custom resize action. So here we can see what the default React Grid layout behavior is like. So when resizing an item, this library would always push the adjacent items out of the way downwards, um, even if there was space to the right. So when we actually tried this on dashboards, we found that this was not always the most ideal behavior. Um, and this is because on dashboards, widgets that are placed next to each other in a row are often related. So when rearranging, users generally want to keep them in a row if possible. And we can see here that the resize action would not only displace the other widgets in the row, but also disrupt all the rows underneath with the push down behavior. So here in the demo, like not only is the row of items zero, one, two broken, but items three, four, and five are also no longer in order, which in general is just like a lot of displacement for one action. So to solve this, we created a custom resize action that um, is called nudging. Uh, which would push the collided widgets to the right if there is space instead of down. And that way we're able to preserve the spatial relationships of the existing widgets in a row. And the other custom action was the drag action. So in React Grid Layout, the drag is pretty similar to Resize in that it follows all the same rules where it will always displace collided items downwards and then fill the space from underneath. So here in the example, uh, by moving item number one to the right, uh, item two is pushed down and item five from the bottom row 
floats up to fill the empty space. And this was like a consistent rule that worked most of the time. But when dragging widgets horizontally, we found that most users wanted to simply swap the position of the adjacent items rather than displace it downwards and having something from the bottom flow up. So without this custom swap, this action would take multiple steps and leave the dashboard in a more disrupted state. So in order to fix this, we implemented a check to see if swapping is possible on every drag and prioritize that instead of the default uh, drag action. Yeah, so now let's just take a look at how this swap is actually calculated in the layout engine. So in this example, we want to check if it's possible to swap the blue note widget with the two green square notes uh, when it's dragged to the right, um, which it is. So the action that's being taken here is moving the blue rectangle from position 00, zero to 40, uh, where it would collide with the other two widgets. And we first start by uh, finding the available space that is freed up by the moving item from its original position to its move position, which would be four. And then next we find all of the collisions in the area of the moving items, original position in the new drag position. So in this case, we would find that the two green squares are overlapping this area. So they would be added to the collision list. And from the list of uh, the collided items, uh, we would then calculate the collision width, uh, which is how much space uh, all, all of the items take up overall um, in the list. So in this case, since each green square has a width of two, the total collision width uh, would also be four. And then uh, we also need to account for the Y positions of the collided items. Um, and then we do that by calculating the minimum and maximum Y positions of all of the collided items. In this case would be zero and two. And then with all of these variables calculated, um, if the collision width doesn't exceed the available space and the minimum and maximum Y positions are contained within the moving items own uh, Y in height, uh, we are able to safely swap these these elements uh, and then end up with this layout. Yay. <laughs> yeah, um, so besides for the custom collision algorithms and our more polished drag and drop interactions, uh, I think the most significant difference between this layout engine and React Grid layout is um, the nested grid structure. So groups are a widget type that were in, that was introduced on time boards. Um, they're added to dashboards just like um, other widgets, but users can place widgets inside of them to create sections for related graphs. And these sections can be named, collapsed, uh, and reordered pretty easily. Uh, so with this new layout system, we wanted to have flexible positioning both outside and inside of groups. So in order to support this, not only is the overall dashboard on a 12 column grid, but each group also contains their own 12 column grid with relatively positioned widgets uh, inside of them. And besides for the groups that the users explicitly add to the dashboard, um, which are visible, visible sections, um, under the hood, actually all widgets are rendered within groups. So even the top level widgets that our surrounding and in between visible groups are also wrapped in the in full width 12 column uh, sections. So these we would consider invisible groups, uh, which are highlighted in purple. Um, and they're invisible because they don't have any styling that the user can see. And the user would just read these widgets as ungrouped on the top level grid. Um, so now we can see that the top level grid is comprised of only vertically stacked groups that span the, the whole width. And structuring the, the dashboard in this way gives us the ability to have dynamic heights for groups and skip layout recalculation uh, when widgets inside of groups are being dragged around. So, and then dividing the dashboard into these horizontal slices would also provide more flexibility in display modes, uh, which we'll dive into more later. 
Cool. Thanks. Uh, super interesting. One of the things that I loved about this project when I when I started learning about it, so Edwin gave uh, an internal talk uh, to Datadog engineers about this project, and I thought it would it was so interesting that we had to make this a Datadog on episode. So one of the things that I loved is the all this interaction that happened between the design and and engineers to get that quick feedback loop. Um, so to try to explain that how that worked uh, with a concrete example, uh, we chose uh, a feature, that important feature that, that has this new dashboard layout, uh, which is high density mode, and see how that feature came first, how it was a little bit discovered, and, and how it was designed and implemented afterwards. So first of all, Edwin, what, what is high density mode? Yes, so I'd love to talk about it. First, I just have to say, I love that nudging behavior. It's like one of my favorite parts. And it's not that like we have nudging, we have swapping, there's all kinds of stuff going on. So it's not as simple as might meet the eye in these very straightforward demos that Amy is giving. Um, it's what do they say? Like it's harder to make a letter short uh, than long. So high density mode. I mentioned earlier that iterative testing a design and the, the sort of fast design and development process worked for big features and problems too. This is what I was thinking of. This was one of the biggest problems uh, for our new dashboards. Basically, we weren't showing more information on larger screens. We were just stretching it out. Uh, and users viewing dashboards on large monitors expected to see more graphs, higher information density, not just more fidelity in the same graphs, but more graphs. And this expectation came from time boards, which are very popular. Uh, so when you view a time board on a large display, we show more graphs per row because they wrap just like text. So they just kind of, you know, it'll get shorter and wider along with the kind of aspect ratio of your browser. Um, so the wider your screen gets, the more graphs you see. But this new dashboard is different. Uh, users created these layouts carefully and the placement and size of the graphs tell a story. You know, the same reason that we want to nudge adjacent graphs over instead of pushing them down is the reason we don't want to move a bunch of stuff around when your screen gets wide with these dashboards, we would break the layout. So how do you show more data to users on large screens while maintaining their layouts? How do you balance moving stuff around automatically with the author's intention? So a lot of our work on these dashboards is kind of centered around finding that balance in various features. And what we came up with in this case for the widescreen problem is called high density mode. Yeah, so coming up with a solution to our data density problem that had the best behavior, um, it was definitely an, an iterative process and it required a lot of collaboration across development and design. Um, so this is sort of showing the first version of high density mode, uh, which just started as a code prototype to see if we could simply double the columns on the original 12 column grid. And this would be a view only mode that was available on large screens and it would display groups side by side instead of vertically stacked, um, which was sort of taking inspiration from the time board layout, uh, which would reflow widgets on a larger screen. But here, instead of widgets, we would be reflowing the group sections. And the 12 column grid could be e easily divided into ver the vertically stacked sections uh, because of how we implemented invisible groups, um, which ensured that even the ungrouped widgets would be always contained within a full width slice. Um, and this approach uh, definitely increased the amount of widgets visible on a large screen, uh, which would solve our density issue. Um, and the two column layout that resulted from it looked pr pretty promising. So we decided to keep going with this idea. And after a few rounds of user testing uh, in the format that Edwin described er um, earlier, uh, we were able to identify some areas uh, to improve high density mode. And the two main findings from testing were that users would often try editing with this mode enabled and that not everyone was easily able to identify how the groups were being rearranged into two columns uh, unless they were really familiar with the contents of the dashboard because this mode reshuffled the vertical ordering of groups. So all of these, this led to the second iteration of high density mode uh, where full width, the full width sections were still being displayed in 
two columns, uh, but we changed how the dashboard was being split. So instead of reflowing groups side by side, the layout would split the groups down the middle and then display the second half on the right side. And we really like this way of dividing the board because it kept the vertical ordering of groups and users could more easily understand how the mode was altering the dashboard layout. And also because during user testing sessions that we found a lot of people were trying to edit it, um, we wanted to have behaviors that the user expected. So we came to the conclusion that it would not be enough to just have it as a view only option. And then this ended up being a good thing because also we wanted a solution that could work as a default view on large monitors. Uh, so at adding editing capabilities would increase the utility of high density mode enough to make it possible to show this view by default instead of just keeping it as an option that could be enabled. So although incredibly useful supporting all of the editing features that we added to this new layout system came with its own set of complications for high, high density mode. Yes, the story of every feature we added basically just became its own rabbit hole. Uh, so allowing editing in this display mode presented a new problem in the kind of automatic behavior versus author intent space, which is where do you draw the line for how different this layout can be uh, on a wide screen? Like we definitely didn't want to support a completely separate saved layout where things could, you know, change size or position relative to one another. Like we didn't want it to be a, com a completely new arrangement um, when users entered this mode. I think that would be probably too much to ask of our engineers. Uh, and also for users, it would be complicated to understand that uh, that's what was going on here and you know, would make maintaining a dashboard like at least two times more cumbersome because you have to think about both these modes. Uh, so we wanted this to be derived from the 12 column layout. So that, that, that high density mode isn't kind of uh, the canonical layout of the dashboard, but is always a derived layout. And at first, we leaned into automatic behavior to accomplish this. Like we made the assumption, for example, that people would prefer both of these columns to be about the same height. Uh, so after every move, the layout would automatically rebalance the groups on each side. And this also it made the aspect ratio wider. So, you know, we thought if users have all this space, let's just try to fit everything in so they might not have to scroll. But once we tested this very automatic behavior, we could basically immediately tell that we had the wrong approach. Uh, so, you know, plus one for testing early. Users were really fighting with the behavior. Like it was definitely not going unnoticed, like uh, squeeze to fit or nudging. Uh, if the user dragged this group on the bottom left up to the top right and dropped it, we would immediately rebalance the sides. And the result for this specific drag from bottom left to top right, uh, this is why we use it as an example, it would just revert back to exactly the way it was before they dragged the element. This is obviously very frustrating. Like it seems, it seems broken. Um, so the rebalancing algorithm was was too automatic. Yeah. So what we came up with was sort of like a balance of automatic and manual behavior. So high density mode would always display the bottom half of the dashboard on the right side to keep it as a derived layout, uh, but the split point between the halves would be saved as part of the dashboard payload if items were rearranged in this mode. Uh, so now that if the user drags that group from the bottom left to the top right, we would save it as the new split point. Um, and this would be done by adding an additional property uh, to um, is column break to the top right widget in high density mode. So this means that now uh, once the dashboard has been rearranged in high density mode, uh, it would always split in the same place, no matter who is viewing it. And users could also control what data is visible on the top right of the board and also how the board is balanced visually. Uh, so now that we have like an intuitive and consistent way of splitting the dashboard to show greater data density, uh, there were still some cases where no division of the layout would look good in this mode. Uh, and this is because every touching widget that was not part of, of a visible group would be wrapped in a single invisible group. Um, as we see here, all of the purple ungroup widgets are considered one invisible group. And this ended up being a usability problem in, in high density mode 
because we only split in between groups. So when this layout was moved to a larger monitor, um, this is what it would look like. It would create a very uneven split. And this layout doesn't really look intentional, nor does it provide a good default viewing experience for people on big monitors. Um, so then it came to the question of how do we solve this? And this ended up being one of the more difficult technical challenges for high density mode. Um, altering a lot of the fundamental layout logic of the system. So instead of wrapping all adjacent ungrouped widgets into one invisible group, uh, we were able to create more full width divisions by looking at where the widget baselines align. So within the cluster of the purple widgets, uh, we can make an additional split after the first three widgets uh, without, without disrupting the layout because um, uh, they all align um, at the bottom across the 12 columns. And this was particularly challenging to implement because during a drag event, we wanted all of the ungrouped items in purple to collide and flow up just like one full grid. Um, so the split could only be made after the change was over and the new compact, compacted layout had been calculated. So that means during an item change, the stacked invisible groups would be merged. And then after the change, we would check for baseline alignment and then split again if possible. Uh, so all that's to say that on a large monitor, the same layout can now be displayed like this, um, which is a much more balanced view in high density mode. Yes. Very nice. So one last thing about high density mode that I have to talk about, and this is one of my favorite examples of, you know, small piece of polish that makes a big difference, I think, that we added very late in the design and development process. Uh, so the problem was some users were trying to drag graphs and groups into the center of the dashboard. This is this a problem, part of the, the rabbit hole of editing, editing to high density mode. Uh, you know, now that users can edit in high density mode, what are the ways that it's different than editing in uh, the 12 column grid mode? And uh, one way is that it's impossible to drag something into the center of the dashboard. And that's because it's, you know, the division point between two halves. And if we would allow a widget to like span the whole two halves or be in the center of the two halves, we wouldn't be able to put the layout back together again for someone who is viewing the dashboard on a, on a narrower screen. So somehow we had to communicate to the user that this was not allowed, uh, but we had to figure out something that didn't involve like text or a tool tip or a tutorial or something because users who are in the middle of a drag event are very focused on the drag. You know, they're in a rush to get the widget where they want it to be. Uh, and you just need to convey the rule. Like you don't, you don't have the user's attention to show anything more than just the rule. So what we ended up doing and you can see it here as I drag across the middle, is rendering this solid bright pink border down the center, which is a variant of the grid lines which appear uh, in the background, but those are uh, dashed instead of solid. So we found that users who encountered this line, like they understood it was intentional and that they couldn't place a widget on top of it, even if they didn't understand that it was part of high density mode uh, or why it was not allowed. So I just love little little details that do this kind of dance with the user and try to communicate something in a in a quick and intuitive way. And there are so many more details like this that I wish we could have talked about, like you know resizing widgets the way that we round whether uh, it snaps to the uh, like a smaller grid cell or the larger grid cell based on if you're decreasing or increasing the size. There's so many details that are neat like that that we worked on that make this um that make this fun to use. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I agree. Uh, this I, I don't have a front end background. Uh, so for me, learning how these things are designed and are implemented and learning how well thought are those little details uh, that they just work for you as a user uh, was was so great to see. Um, so this new lay dashboard layout is available to, to all Datadog customers. So if you want to check it out uh, when you're creating a new dashboard, just click on the new dashboard and you will see that you will have the options of the time boards and screen boards, which are the old ones on the right. If you click to the one on the left, the full one, it will create this new lay uh, layout engine. Uh, that I really recommend to, to try it out uh, because it basically have the best of wor both worlds.
and I'll start with the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> again, if you have questions, Q&A button. Uh, we are going to start with a questions by question by Tolle. Uh, he's asking, are you applying the same design principles to other products other than dashboards? UX is often a big complaint when using Datadog. One big one, big one would be addressing how overwhelming Datadog is when you start using it. Edwin, maybe you take can that take one? that one. Yes. Yeah. Well, we got a bunch of people who are here just dedicated to making the UX better. So rest assured, we are very concerned and thinking about it and making improvements every day. Uh, for onboarding in particular, I think that there is a very active ongoing project to improve the way we do onboarding everywhere for, for new users and just new team members for existing orgs. Uh, and you know specifically what we've been working on here, which is like a palette of draggable entities and this kind of editable canvas. We actually have another product coming out that's very similar to this. So that's a more direct example about uh, how we're going to take some of the things we learned from uh, this dashboards product and apply it to um, to a new product. Cool. Um, also, a uh, follow up to the question from Tolly as well: Are screen or time boards going to be deprecated in favor of this new layout? That's easy. So I can just answer that. Uh, definitely not. We're not <laughs> going to deprecate anyone's existing dashboards. Uh, we have a dream for how all of these dashboards are no longer going to be something that you have to you know, choose up front. We want to make it really easy to pick the right layout for your needs, even if you have an existing dashboard, to be able to just switch between them. Uh, so we don't want this to be as, as much of a division in the future. But you know, every, every dashboard type is special and has its own kind of unique um, bonuses that that or use cases that the other types can't quite fill and so we, we want to emphasize and and build on those rather than deprecating them cool um so we don't have any more questions from the audience but i have other follow-up questions that i that i had i wanted to to ask you um so this one's for emmy so with with high density mode is splitting widgets that align horizontally as a new invisible group the the thing that you were explaining before of how try to, to get that split balanced. Um, those invisible groups needs to be recalculated, I guess, on every drag event, is that correct? And, and how is that a performance? Uh, does, does it have a performance impact? Yeah, so we were able to minimize the performance impact because the split and merge would be only done like uh, when the drag starts and when the drag stops. So like all of the in-between like moves, uh, the the groups would already be calculated. Cool. Um, and a, a little bit of a follow up with that question. In terms of performance, what, what was the most challenging uh, thing that you had to deal with? Yeah, so I think like overall performance was a pretty like big deal in this project. Um, I think one of the main impacts was we had to find ways to prevent re-rendering in uh, so like every time that the props would change, uh, like the whole grid would re-render. Re so we wanted to mi minimize that as much as possible. So instead of passing down props throughout, like through components, um, we did like lots of containers and like we use contexts. Um, and then we also split uh, the layout from the data of widgets so that when the data updates, um, the layout wouldn't recalculate. We also have a cool windowing feature uh, yeah. So that we don't load uh, like on a very long dashboard all the widgets at once, which was kind of freezing the browser on some really intense dashboards. Nice, good. And um, another question that I have. Um, so I, I see these front-end applications becoming more and more complex and with more interaction. Uh, so based based on that. Um, do you think, Edward, that storyboarding and prototyping still makes sense, or shall we just ditch them in favor of always prototyping and code as much as we can? We can. Yeah, although I, I may have come down too hard on storyboarding in this presentation, I think there's still a place for all of this stuff. You know, I, it still helped us, uh, especially at the beginning, fig figure some fundamentals out for the project. But uh, it, it seems like prototyping is getting faster and easier and more integrated into like every um, product design design tool. You know, Figma has been releasing tons of prototyping features to 
get designers closer to a, a sort of an interactive app. People have made some really impressive stuff in Figma. So it does seem like more featureful prototypes are more of a norm now than, for example, storyboarding a couple of simple states. But you have to start somewhere. Uh, probably wouldn't be a good idea to try to start at the highest fidelity possible uh, when you don't even have an idea of what the foundation of your product is going to be. Maybe you can always start with a napkin. <laughs> you can always start with a napkin. That's true. Good. Um, so we don't have any more questions and, and we are getting to the top of the hour. So I think we can, we can leave it there. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks Edwin and Amy for sharing how you build this project. I think it was a fantastic result. Um, so if you're a data lab customer, uh, please have a look because um, they're, they're great. Uh, so thanks again, and I'll see you on the next data.com. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Bye. Laura. Bye-bye.